A myriad of islands in deep blue water. The Cyclades are the archetype of the Greek islands. Well anchored in the heart of ancient myths, this world bears 3,000 years of Mediterranean history. Destinies, populations and civilizations crossed and met here, a fragrance of the Mediterranean Sea with aromas from Asia Minor, the power of the elements. Aren't they a foretaste of the earthly paradise in a world where men and gods have never been so close? Generally, the visitor arrives in the Cyclades through the island of Syros, the sea crossroads of the archipelago with its capital Ermupolis. Here you enter a complex, enchanting, mysterious world sculpted by centuries of history and legends. Ermupolis owes its name to Hermes, the Greek god of commerce. This lively and charming town with its numerous restored neoclassical buildings was the seafaring center of Greece until the beginning of the 20th century. Perched high up on the hills, the Catholic town of Arno Siros and the orthodox neighborhood of Rodado stand out against a mountainous background. The Cyclades are at the center of this encounter between the east and the west. It's delightful to stroll through these narrow alleyways flanked by whitewashed houses and to admire the view. Most of the cities of the Cyclades are perched on hills and characterized by their labyrinthine streets. During the 16th century, the Ottomans abandoned the Cyclades, which then became the prey of pirates. Every city or town had numerous churches. Places of worship have always been very numerous here. They evolved according to the beliefs of the people who shaped the history of these islands. The Cyclades are masters at juggling with splendor, devotion, culture and the Mediterranean good mood that makes this world so rich and fascinating without ever heavily weighing on the visitor. Every stone is a piece of history, but the numerous cafes' terraces also prove that one enjoys living and having fun here. This is a bust of Marcos Vampakaris, a famous repetico singer, a form of Greek blues that is very much appreciated here. A nearby museum was built in his honor. The caretaker tries his utmost to keep the legend alive, but his mastery of the bouzouki, the traditional Greek instrument, is rather limited, so to speak. The upper part of the town offers a splendid view of the gulf. Above the Catholic neighborhood is the 13th century cathedral Agios Georgios, which dominates Ermupolis. Miaoulis Square is a marvel of urban architecture in the neoclassical style. Also worth seeing is the Apollo Theatre, a small-sized replica of the Scala of Milan. This part of the town is particularly impressive. It reflects the contribution of refugees during the War of Independence who fled persecution by the Turks at the beginning of the 19th century. Later in the 19th century, Ermupolis became the trading, seafaring and cultural center of Greece. This opulence is felt everywhere and more particularly in the religious edifices built at the time. The architecture constantly conveys the multiple influences, the ancient classical and Byzantine styles. Here the dialogue of cultures is not wishful thinking. It is engraved in the stone and belongs to the daily life of the islanders. The old patrician houses built facing the sea are a witness to the splendor of the period when Ermupolis almost looked like a small Venice in the Aegean Sea. The preserved authentic lifestyle is still appreciated in the little cafes. The visitor should not miss these popular and pleasant spots to have a drink or a coffee and blend into the local life. These popular 
cafes are an amusing contrast to the imposing town hall built by the Bavarian architect Zilla and the statue of Admiral Miolis. A Greek square remains an agora where people enjoy meeting and talking. Today still, we understand why the Greeks invented democracy. A short ride west of Ermupolis leads to another world. The small sea resort of Galisas has one of the most beautiful beaches of Syros. Towards the north, Kini is a charming small harbour that is becoming more popular but remains preserved and where one can fully savour the island's charm. Landscapes, the rocks plunging into the sea and the ever-changing light throughout the day constantly offer new spectacles that one never tires of admiring. We leave Syros for Tinos, an island in the northern Cyclades not very well known by the tourist, but that has preserved the charms of an authentic life. Being exposed to the winds from the north is not always an advantage. This specificity even made it the home of Aeolus. But Tinos is a very beautiful island, covered with mountains and hillsides, studded with approximately 40 villages that spread like white marble on the dark side of the hills. The pigeon houses of Tinos are genuine architectural jewels. From afar, we can see their turrets adorned with creative and complex motifs. This island is a hymn to beauty. Even creation and originality try to outdo each other in the relief, finally chiselled by erosion. And with the amazing view of the sea, the spectacle is complete. On the road to Panormos, Piagos is a delightful village that was a remarkable sculpture centre until the beginning of the 20th century. By following the coast to the north, we arrive in the small port of Panormos. In the past, the green marble of the Malas Quarry was exported from this harbour. The village spreads over the hills in the shape of an amphitheatre. Each village has its own character and originality. Heading back towards the southwest, Cardiani is one of the most beautiful villages of the island. Elections are held here today. It's an important day and an opportunity for families to get together. Those who work and live on the mainland have come back to vote in the village where they were born. Here, one does not easily give up one's roots. After all, an election is an excellent excuse to be with family and friends as well as celebrate and dance in the streets. A happy interpretation of public life in the country that invented democracy. The streets of Cardiani are narrow and shaped by a maze of houses, arches and passageways where it's fun to get lost. The details of the architecture are an invitation to stroll, looking upwards so as not to miss a single detail. 
One often comes upon these embedded fountains decorated with a bar relief sculpted in a marble, a specificity of the island. Oratinos, the largest town on the island, is a major place of worship for the Orthodox. From the seafront, the pilgrims walk up the main street towards the Panagia Evangelistria church. The imposing edifice dominates the entire town. The church was built in 1823 following the dream of a nun. She had a revelation that a miraculous icon of the Virgin was buried here. According to the legend, it was painted by Luke, the evangelist himself. The neoclassical style buildings built in marble from the Panormos quarries surround a pretty square with arcades. In the main building, the fabulous chandeliers remind us of a suspended garden. The setting befits the miraculous icon of the Virgin Mary, covered with gold, silver, jewels and pearls, and surrounded by religious offerings. Every year on August 15th, this church welcomes thousands of pilgrims who come here to pray to the Madonna and ask her to fulfill a wish. The island of Tinos is famous for its artist. Until the beginning of the 20th century, marble work was a major activity and very well known. The marble of the Parthenon is said to have come from the quarries of Tinos. Maravelas Argiris has preserved this secular tradition. As far as the marble is concerned, I mainly work with the one from the Vassinus area on Tinos. Its quality is excellent. You can work at it from all sides and in 3D. Maravellas Argiris exhibits his work in his workshop nearby. His creations portray religious figures or characters from Greek mythology. The originality of this artist resides in the refined lines and modern interpretation of traditional motifs. Two well-known modern sculptors, Dimitrios Philippotis and Yanoulis Halipas, were born on Tinos, where the marble sculpting tradition is still perpetuated today. The marble is present almost all over in the towns and villages. In Pyrgos, the bus stop certainly is one of the most elegant ones in the world. But the marble activity remains an important one on Tinos. The craftsman master is extraction from the marble veining, the cutting and the polishing, a know-how still appreciated in the entire world. This marble can be found in Buckingham Palace and the Louvre. craft industry was developed using marble where original creations blend with horrors. The many religious edifices don't escape the all-in-marble rule. The cemetery of this church is also in marble. A dream of eternity under a material that will be impressive for centuries to come.
following the rivers of Bourgainvilliers that overflow at each street corner, one easily returns to the road of the living for a few spectacular plunging views magnified by the sunset. Mykonos accepts without any complex its glamorous and somewhat fiendish reputation, but under the sequins, the island has preserved its charming and infinitely entertaining nature, where the star's whims are tempered by the charm of a traditional Cycladic town and by the islanders who have had 40 years to get used to the tourist without having their Greek identity suffer too much. Fishing remains an important resource, even if many have given up this hard work, faced with the impoverishment of the depths of the sea to succumb to the tourist windfall. But these little harbours are the identity of these Mediterranean coasts. Without their fishermen, these towns and villages would not quite be the same. It still is possible to take a quiet stroll in the old part of the town's labyrinth. As you might expect in the Cyclades, shops for tourists abound here, although there are slightly more of them. The high tourist season is in July and August, after the invasion in the spring of groups of youngsters for educational trips that aren't always cultural. Between the fashionable boutiques, exhibits and museums, everyone will find what he likes and enjoys. The Maritime Museum has a fantastic collection of objects from all over the Aegean Sea, such as this ancient lighthouse of Mykonos. Phoenician boats, Greek vessels, Latin sails, Finnish hourglasses, this museum offers a complete vision of the history of the Mediterranean Sea through ships and their cargoes. To the modern man on vacation, the sea often only consists of beaches. During the high season, be prepared for crowds taking in the sun. If you can, take advantage of the fall that is always beautiful and far more peaceful. The harbour has adapted to mass tourism. The huge ferries come here to look down on the small fishing boats and sailboats of vacationers. Greek tropicalism has its enthusiast and the Cyclades are an ideal place to spend great vacations where the joys of the beach can be added to other distractions. By climbing a little higher, the typical wind-beaten landscapes of the Cyclades reappear. Lined up on the hills, a few typical windmills remain. Very few are still in operation. Their sailless wings are reduced to wooden skeletons, yet they have not lost their charm. Here the wings of desire make this beloved run towards his betrothed, a moment of instantaneous happiness before a most romantic dinner on the water. Mykonos has not lost its charm. Its interest lies in its diversity. The bars on the waterfront are most enjoyable at sunset. An urge for excessive shopping? The shops are open until late in the evening. You certainly should be prepared to pay higher prices, but from a chic boutique to a fashionable jewellery store, followed by a nice walk on the waterfront, you have a winning ticket for a great vacation. The restaurants and bars attract a fairly elegant international clientele. Partying may last late into the night.
The Cyclades owe their name to the circle they form around the island of Delos, that is its sacred heart. A few kilometers from the western coast of Mykonos, after a short crossing by boat, we arrive in the heart of mythology. Delos is none other than the birthplace of Apollo and Artemis. The archaeological site is one of the first in Greece and the most important in the Cyclades. During the 8th century BC, a celebration is set to honor Apollo. The most ancient temples and sanctuaries are from this period. During the 5th century BC, Delos fell to the hands of Athens, for whom the island was a geostrategic position to strengthen its ambitions in the Aegean Sea. Athens launched up a defensive alliance, the Delian League, whose war chest was hidden on the island. Delos thus reached the peak of its power, becoming one of the three religious centers of Greece. The terrace of the lions spreads out from the extension of Apollo's sanctuary. These proud-looking wild animals sculpted in marble were offered to Delos by the Naxians during the 7th century BC to watch over the sacred site. In 167 BC, under Roman rule, Delos became a free port. Its prosperity increased due to the lucrative slave market where 10,000 slaves could be sold per day. During the following century, the ancient religions lost their importance. At the same time, new trade routes were opened. Delos began a long and painful decline. Many ancient buildings were destroyed to be used for new constructions. The island became the prey of pirates under the Ottoman period. It is only during the Renaissance that the greatness of its past will be recognized once again. Archaeological findings offered a better comprehension of the wealth of this past and revealed the exceptional character of the site. It is one of the most visited in the world. Delos offers the opportunity to understand an entire period of the history of the West. The people of the Mediterranean, in their exceptional diversity, constituted one of the pillars of the civilization that we have inherited. On the way to Naxos, the legendary past does not leave us. According to the legend, Theseus left Ariane after she helped him get out of the labyrinth. Distraught, she quickly recovered. Dionysos, the god of the island, consoled her and married her. During the Middle Ages in 1207, the island was conquered by the Venetians after the Fourth Crusade. The Venetian Marco Sanudo became the Duke of Naxos and built a castle overlooking the city of which a part of the dungeon remains. Houses that belonged to Venetian families were built around the castle and their exterior walls created in fact a defensive rampart. The entire construction is called Castro. From that period, beautiful houses again influenced by Venetians remain. They are often adorned with the coat of arms of their original owner. This 13th century house belongs to Nicolaos Caravias de la Roca. The visit will take us to this fascinating Venetian past. This is a house where my family is living from 1714, almost 300 years. And uh, most of the objects that they are in this house are objects that are participating for many, many years, for over 8,000 years, to my grandfather's de la Rosa, Dukes of Athens families, and my grandmother's family, uh, Barocci, Dukes from Venice. This family saga retraces part of the history of the island to the overlapping influences from the population to the Mediterranean. Entering the privacy of this world allows us to understand its refinement in minute detail. The air of Naxos will turn your head.
You must take your time on this exquisite island with its beautiful beaches, lively harbour and, as on all these Cyclades islands, extraordinary sunsets. At nightfall, Nicolaus Caravias de la Roca welcomes in his home a music and traditional dance show. It is an opportunity for this enthusiast to carry on the tradition of exchanges that is at the heart of this complex world where the cultures and traditions penetrate and influence each other. While everybody is still sleeping, the harbour livens up. The fishermen go out to sea before dawn to avoid the northern wind, the terrible Meltimi that can rapidly become a threat as soon as the sun is high in the sky. In the Paragardi family, the men have been fishermen for four generations. Originally from Genoa, these seamen symbolize once again the intermingling of Mediterranean populations that were disseminated all along its coast. Here, as elsewhere, the fish supply is decreasing. Fishing as an activity has been considerably reduced. The fleets of trawlers are being gradually replaced by ferries, these giants of the sea, symbols of the tourism windfall. Every year, thousands of visitors arrive on these islands, set within a perimeter that does not exceed 100 kilometers. Yet they are a true concentration of history where the fragrances of ancient Greece and Asia Minor blend, with Greek, Roman, Byzantine, Frank, Venetian and Ottoman influences, civilizations have rarely overlapped to such an extent, making up the unique identity of this archipelago. 20 minutes from the town of Horonaxos in the Tragia Plain, the village of Halki is at the heart of the rich trading history of the island. Since the end of the 19th century, the village has been famous for its liqueur, the kitron, made with the fruit and leaves of the citron tree. Introduced in the Mediterranean area around 300 BC, the Valendras distillery continues to make Kitron in the old-fashioned way. Here you can admire the enchanting rooms full of old earthenware jars and copper stills. Ouzo is made by using grape skins and citron tree leaves. With a liqueur-like version, they also produce the Kitron that was very successful during the 19th century. However, the farming of the citron tree was gradually reduced and replaced by more profitable crops. But for the past few years, it's the object of renewed interest. The rediscovery of the traditional activities is a relatively new phenomenon. But it is crucially important for the local economy and allows the islanders to continue to live here. Thanks to the increase in tourism, many traditional crafts have been revived, such as this weaving workshop where these traditional motives are created. Since the increase in tourism in the 1970s, the islands have slowly emerged from their economical stagnation. Until then, many islanders lived in great poverty. 
Many of them gave up and left for the mainland, the United States and Australia in search of work. Another workshop is worth the detour. It is here that Katerina Bolesh creates and exhibits her ceramics. The artist draws her inspiration from the ancient sacred themes of the olive tree and fish for her very original creations. She is now famous throughout the world. Most of her pieces are decorated by her companion, Alex Reichhardt, who creates very original jewellery. The Tragia Plain is covered with olive trees and studded with villages and small Byzantine churches. A little further, Apirantos is a lovely mountain village. Authentic, it suddenly brings you back to a very distant Greece. Its inhabitants are the descendants of Cretan refugees who fled their country because of the Ottomans. They still speak an exquisite dialect. The village has always had a passion for great political causes and always was a haven for major intellectuals. By following the coast to the north, on donkeys if you wish, you reach Apollonas. Visitors from around the globe come here to admire the Skouros, an unfinished statue of the 7th century BC. It is the main attraction of this fishing village that has become a well-known sea resort with its very pretty beach. On his way back, the visitor will discover an old Venetian fortress prior to finishing his visit in the shade of the olive trees that spread towards the horizon. To the south, Amorgos is one of the prettiest Greek islands, but also one of the hardest to reach. After the movie Le Grand Bleu was shot here, it has somewhat developed its accommodations for tourists. Catapola, the main harbour, nestles in a spectacular bay in the greenest part of the island. But Amorgos is naturally wild and pushes its jagged mountains from the sea like the backbone of a dragon. Attached to a sheer cliff, the 11th century monastery of Panagia, Ozovitiza, is one of the oldest Byzantine constructions in the Cyclades. A stone stairway leads to this timeless retreat. The monastery is said to have been built to hide an icon saved by a pious woman originally from Kosova, a village in Palestine, but her identity was never known. The miraculously saved icon is not in the chapel, the oldest are from the 16th century. This legend contributes to the charm and mystery of the place where one can admire Byzantine masterpieces. The chapel is set in the crevices of the rock. The monastery was built 300 meters above the sea into the face of a cliff. In places, it is only one and a half meters deep. During the 18th century, approximately 100 monks lived here. At the beginning of the 1990s, only two monks remained. Today, a few younger monks have moved here from Eastern Europe. The Archimandrite, the superior of the monastery, is a character worth a detour. He is always kindly willing to make you visit this magical place. Below the little chapel of Agia Anna was built overhanging an amazing cove where mermaids come to bathe in the sun. Today the chapel is full of activity. The Archimandrite is about to celebrate a wedding. 
An enchanting setting makes you want to say yes. In the purest orthodox tradition, the wedding is attended by the families and friends. In general, the islanders of the Cyclades, like the Greeks, are very attached to their religious traditions. 98% of the population belongs to the orthodox faith. Although the younger generations are less pious, the ritual is generally observed as it is an integral part of their identity. In Egiali, the second harbour of Amorgos, the fishermen have not gone out to sea today. The weather is treacherous. The wind rose and the sea is choppy. The men prefer taking care of their boats and repairing their nets. Since ancient times, the seamen have learned to be wary of the unpredictable character of the Mediterranean, especially here. Remember Homer's story, it took Ulysses years to return home, pushed by capricious winds and the will of the gods. Above the town, a Morgos almost brutally reveals its wild nature a mineral setting with a few hamlets more or less abandoned and tiny churches. Life here is very traditional. The main resource is raising sheep and goats. These rustic species are used to the harshness of the environment. The shepherds are the ultimate lookouts of the easternmost part of the Cyclades. Hanging onto their hills, they scan the sea that hits the inaccessible coast of one of the most mysterious islands of the archipelago. In the southern part, Santorini is considered the most spectacular of all Greek islands. Every year, thousands of visitors remain spellbound and astonished in front of the sheer cliffs that drop into the sea and shape a setting that leaves you breathless. Despite the tourist, Fira, the largest town of the island, has not lost its almost unreal aura. From above the town, the visitor can discover the amazing views. It is simply enchanting to get lost in the narrow streets. Today, the houses that overhang the cliff have been renovated. Some of them have become bed and breakfast accommodations for a unique vacation. In 1956, a violent earthquake hit Santorini, destroying most of Fira. The accomplished rebuilding is remarkable. Should you be searching for a charming place to spend your vacation, your quest is over. To go from one terrace to another, contemplating this suspended world from your room can justify a stay on Santorini.
The plunging views on the bay, the play of the sun and clouds on the white houses contribute to set you in an enchanting atmosphere that almost seems unreal. The Dorians, Venetians and Turks occupied Santorini as they did the other islands of the Cyclades. But the Minoans left the most profound influence here. They came from neighbouring Crete, where they had established their capital 2,000 years BC. At the time, the round island was called Strongyli. Around 1650 BC, an incredible volcanic explosion provoked the subsistence of the entire central part of the island into the sea, only leaving a crown of rocks. These are the most impressive geological sites in the world. According to archaeologists, the cataclysm could have led to the end of the Minoan civilization. Did Santorini belong to the legendary continent of the Atlantis? The Byzantine churches that now hang over this lost world don't give any answers to those who are fascinated by history. Santorini remains mysterious. The villages and houses must compose with this mineral universe. The human presence seems barely tolerated in this world that does not totally belong to man. Many houses are embedded in the rock. The power of the elements, the sea, the volcano that only sleeps with one eye isn't without consequence on the character of the inhabitants marked by carefreeness and resignation. Here, one appreciates the simple life, and you are invited to share this vision, such as grilled fish that under these circumstances has a very special flavour. At the foot of the village of Oya, you can enjoy one of the most beautiful sunsets of Santorini while sipping one of the delicious wines produced on the island. Cable car is a practical means of transportation that offers a guaranteed view. Going down along the cliff is breathtaking. The most courageous visitor may go back on foot. Santorini is an island where history and legends blend. It opens the doors to a world that is not well known and invites you to revisit the myths. A boat excursion will allow you to stand back and understand what happened here. Over a million years ago, the island belonged to a chain of volcanoes. They fell asleep and 3,000 years ago, the men from the Neolithic came here to take advantage of the fertile soil. Confirmed by archaeological findings, they led a fairly idyllic life. The enormous eruption in 1650 BC that gave the island its present shape brutally put an end to this golden age. The origin of the Atlantis legend may simply be here. Wherever you look, the violence of the volcanic history of Santorini appears. The black sand beaches, the striated cliffs with layers of lava and ashes that plunge into the sea, the habitat devastated by the earthquakes. The volcano may be sleeping, but it's not extinct. Barely felt tremors are still quite frequent. This world is suspended. It may be this fragility that one wishes to experience here, at the terrace of one of the most beautiful cafes of the planet. Let's lift what could perhaps be our last glass. Heading north, we are off to the western Cyclades and Serifos.
first rays of the sun unveil fabulous Aura, a labyrinth of white houses leaning against a rocky peak. The tiny port of Livadi lays in the curve of a peaceful bay. In spite of its increasing popularity, we still have the feeling that the modern world has forgotten certain places. From the hilltop, Aura shines like snow. From the harbour, stairs lead up the hill where a stroll is a very pleasant experience. Enjoy seeing an old windmill or a small church, architectural figures that string along the Cyclades like the beads of a rosary. The views from the hilltop are always as striking. Aura offers us a peaceful stroll in this white and blue world. On the village square, a terrace seems to be waiting for us to simply enjoy the atmosphere where, compared to the large modern cities, time appears to have stopped. To the south, the beach in a cove near the village of Gutales is not an exception to the feeling of peace and tranquillity that prevails all over the island. With a spectacular coastline and exceptional rocky formations, Mylos cannot hide its volcanic origins. Milos is the westernmost island in the Cyclades. It's a small, quiet island about 10 kilometers long, yet it's known the world over. The famous Venus de Milo was sculpted here. This marble statue from approximately 100 years BC depicts the Greek goddess Aphrodite and is actually on display in the Louvre in Paris. The rocky outcrops of multicolored stratums create an amazing natural picture with the water's shades of blue. Most of the beaches and coves can only be reached by boat, an advantage that allows this mineral and aquatic universe to keep its preserved or almost secret aspect. To the north of the island, the small port of Mandraka gives the measure of the rhythm that animates the island. However, Mylos has known far more tormented periods in its history. During the Peloponnesian War, Mylos was the only Cycladis island that did not join the Athenian alliance. In retaliation, the Athenians killed all its men in 416 BC and the women and children became slaves. It is, of course, difficult to imagine that Milos knew such a drama since the feeling of peace and harmony seems to reign on this island, slowly rocked by the Mediterranean Sea. This cove, protected from the winds, is the ancient port of Milos. Today, this dream place is inhabited by a few fishermen. A stroll among the olive trees leads to the place where the Venus de Milo was discovered in 1820. Brought to Paris to be put on display in the Louvre, the goddess is said to have lost her arms during the transfer. It is without a doubt a sign that she disapproved that men decided to move her like that more than 2,000 years after she was born. The vestige of this theater testify to the presence on the island of a very ancient civilization. One can only wonder, once again, that men and women who lived in such a seemingly isolated place shared such a strong sense of beauty. At 
The end of a journey that led us to discover an amazing world, the memories and images unravel. How can we resist the charm of these islands? Each one fosters its own personality, the hospitality of its islanders and the beauty of its villages. But by coming here, one also touches upon the myths and the history back to the origins of our civilization. It is not by accident that certain gods from ancient Greece were born in these islands. Neither is it by chance that today the visitors accomplish one of the most impressive voyages by coming here.